Olá, gente. Sejam todos bem-vindos. Parece que isso aqui vai ser o último seminário nesse semestre, ou até 2021. Hoje temos a honra e o prazer de ter o Matt Sievert. Um, ele fez o... Ele tem uma graduação em física e espanhol. Então, quem fala espanhol ou portunhol pode fazer perguntas para ele, para ele nessa. E depois ele fez o, depois ele fez o doutorado em Ohio State University. Muita gente aqui se lembra de Mike Lisa, da mesma universidade. Um, depois ele fez postdocs em, depois ele fez postdocs em Los Alamos National Laboratory na Universidade de Rutgers, na Universidade na Universidade de um, Illinois Urbana Champaign com Jorge Noronha, que muita gente aqui se vai lembrar também. E agora é professor, agora é professor. Da IGN, de contagens nesse ponto. No... Então, se tem mais contagem, a gente vai ter um... É agora é professor doutor no New Mexico State University, na Universidade Estadual de Novo México. Ele trabalha em todos os aspectos da QCD, da quarks e gluons a energias, a energias altas. E vai falar para nós da estrutura de próton. Muito obrigado. Um, floor is yours. Por favor, gente, nessa vez nós temos um link para a lista de presença que você vai encher, eu vou mandar o link pelo chat, pelo chat, uh, pelo chat. Um, como sempre, um, como sempre, se tem perguntas urgentes, pode pôr no chat, eu preferiria perguntas depois, porque é mais fácil dirigir tudo, tudo isso à distância, à, à distância assim, mas se tem perguntas urgentes, por favor, Desliga o vídeo, desliga o áudio, se você não é Matt. Porque, porque o Matt que está falando, eu vou dar exemplo agora. Um, floor is yours, please start. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for the invitation. Let me uh, share the screen and make sure it's all correct here. Okay, you should be seeing this full screen. And I think if I have the laser pointer, everyone can see what I'm pointing at. So uh, we're all good to go, looks right. Okay, uh, so maybe let me go ahead and get started then. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to talk to you guys today. The uh, subject that I wanted to address is a, a pretty broad one about how the uh, hot QCD aspects of the experimental program at Rick and the LHC fit together with the cold QCD aspects of the program at places like Rick and Jefferson Lab to try and study, oops, something in shot here. Sorry, let me keep an eye on the chat message. Uh, to, to discuss how we learn about the internal constituents of the proton, their distribution in energy and momentum and spin and everything else, and uh, the state of the field and how we intend to progress in the next 10 years. So the theme is how to dissect the guts of the proton, uh, including recreating droplets of the Big Bang and by building the most powerful electron microscope ever created. So the overview of the talk is as follows. I uh, will start with a discussion about why trying to dissect the proton and understand its internal guts is so complicated. It's a much messier problem than trying to dissect the internal structure of the atom. And the reasons for those differences are deeply reflective of the differences in the fundamental force of strong nuclear physics compared to the electromagnetic force. And so then I'll talk about uh, applications from the hot QCD program, trying to learn about the internal constituents of the proton by heating it up into a plasma that liberates its internal constituents into the quark gluon plasma state. And then I'll contrast that with what we can try to learn about the structure of the proton sort of in vivo, if you like, by using the uh, electron ion collider, which is in a very literal sense, the most powerful electron microscope ever created on Earth. Uh, and then I'll summarize uh, the picture together about where we stand now and where we intend to go in the next 10 years. So uh, without further ado, I, I always like to start the discussion with a comparison between the proton and the atom. And that's because both the proton and the atom are composite states. They're not elementary particles. They are bound states of constituents and they are bound respectively by the strong nuclear force in the case of the proton and the electromagnetic force in the case of the atom. 
And so whatever we can learn about the structure of those bound states is reflective of the underlying force that binds them together and gives them that structure. So uh, it's no coincidence that both the proton and the atom were discovered roughly simultaneously a century ago. Uh, very famously, the uh, discovery of the atomic nucleus was performed by the Rutherford Gold Foil experiment. And the structure of this experiment is one that we will revisit at much higher energy scales later on in the talk. So let me take a moment and remind you. The key principle of the Rutherford scattering experiment was to create a beam of high energy particles by the standards of his day. And uh, while most of the alpha particles coming from the radioactive source went straight through or deflected with very small angles, the really interesting events were the ones where the alpha particle deflected with a large recoil angle. And the reason was that that large recoil was indicative of a hard momentum transfer, and that hard momentum exchange is really sensitive to short distances. And that the occurrence of those events was what uh, gave the evidence that the positive charge of the atom was tightly concentrated into a nucleus. Uh, and so this uh, experiment and the discovery of the structure of the atom itself was uh, uh, essentially simultaneous with the development of the first quantum theories of the atom. So uh, since 100 years ago, when we took the first baby pictures of the proton and baby pictures of the atom, uh, a lot has changed. The atom is now all grown up and is very, the study of atomic structure is incredibly mature and precise. It is so precise that the structure of the atom is used as the definition of time itself, by which I mean that we can create atomic clocks, such as the cesium fountain here shown at NIST, uh, and by calculating to extreme precision and measuring to extreme precision the uh, hyperfine splitting of the ground state of cesium-133, we can uh, define the second in uh, in fundamental units in a way that's uh, an accuracy of uh, 10 to the minus 16 or so. And this is, uh, this is also made possible by the extreme precision of theoretical calculations uh, in electrodynamics. So here's uh, just one example that I pulled out of nowhere. Uh, calculation to 1100 digits of precision, 891 for loop Feynman diagrams. This is absolutely mind blowing to me, the level of precision that can be achieved in calculations of quantum electrodynamics. So in contrast, if the study of the atom has led to a picture of the atom as all grown up and mature, the proton is still stuck in the moody teenager phase saying, you will never understand me. And there's some real truth to that because we don't at this point even understand where gross properties of the proton come from in terms of their elementary constituents. So uh, here's a selection of uh, you know, famous publications uh, discussing some of the major problems that we don't understand about the proton. We don't understand uh, the generation of the proton spin as a sum of the constituents of the proton itself. There are major outstanding puzzles about what the correct radius of the proton is and whether that same radius is seen uh, democratically by electrons and muons. And uh, we also don't understand from first principles how the mass of the proton is generated from its constituents. And this is a, a real fundamental problem since the Higgs mechanism is responsible only for a few percent of the mass of the baryons. And it is QCD, the dynamical interactions of quarks and gluons that generate the vast majority of mass in the universe. So uh, there are lots of even basic things that we do not understand about the proton. And the reason for this discrepancy between the extreme precision of what we have learned about atomic structure and the even basic questions that are still outstanding about the proton is a direct reflection of how much more complicated the strong nuclear force is than the electromagnetic force. So uh, the electromagnetic force is, uh, of course, governed by Maxwell's equations classically. And Maxwell's equations are reflective of the fact that the charge of the electromagnetic force is a scalar that it comes in positive and negative varieties, but there's only one type, there's only one axis of electric charge. And as a consequence of uh, there only being one variety of electric charge, that means that the radiation, the photon fields that come off of those charges is electrically neutral. So you start off with an electron that has a negative charge, it radiates a photon and it's still an electron, it's still negatively charged. You had negative charge in, negative charge out, so the field that came off was electrically neutral. And that leads to the linearity of Maxwell's equations, the very nice superposition principle that we're all familiar with from elementary physics that tells you that uh, if you have two beams of light, then you can simply add their electric fields together and get a superposition of the two fields. 
So uh, the basic equations that describe QCD and uh, the origins of the nuclear force look a lot like Maxwell's equations, but with one fundamental difference. And that's that color charge is a vector. It comes in uh, multiple varieties with multiple independent axes. And those axes are conventionally called red, blue, and green. And the reason for these differences is that, uh, the reason for the difference in the implications of this uh, one fundamental change is that if you have three different axes of charge to rotate between when you emit your fields, then now the field itself becomes charged. So if you start off with a particle that has a blue color state and it radiates a field and then it turns into a red color state, it emitted some net charge in the process. And as a consequence, the gluon fields that describe the interactions in QCD are themselves charged. And that leads to highly nonlinear equations of motion, the Yang-Mills equations. And in terms of uh, sort of a comparison with conventional ENM, this would be like having two beams of light that strongly interact and scatter off of each other. And this is why the strong nuclear force is uh, significantly more complex than uh, the electromagnetic forces. So the self-interactions of those gluons lead to a significant difference between the potential between two heavy quarks compared to the potential between, say, an electron and a positron. The Coulomb potential between two charges in ENM is, of course, an attractive one over R potential that then levels off towards zero at long distances. Whereas in QCD, the nonlinear self-interactions of the gluons uh, causes that the strength of that force to increase, or the strength of the potential to increase as a function of distance. And so instead of leveling off to zero, the potential becomes linear, and it continues to grow to infinity as a function of distance. And uh, that approximate linearity means that the force between a heavy quark and anti-quark uh, is approximately constant, and the value of that constant sigma called the string tension is about one ton. So uh, if you try to pull apart a quark and an anti-quark, you have to pay the price of one ton of force that never decreases, no matter how far apart you separate them. And that leads to the fact that trying to measure the structure of the proton is much more difficult than trying to measure the structure of the atom. If you want to precisely measure the structure of the atom, then you just uh, perform a spectroscopy experiment. You try and excite an electron up to a higher level, or you try to ionize an electron out, and you measure how much energy it took and how much momentum it took. But that doesn't work the same way for QCD. And the reason is because of that uh, string tension, that increasing potential between the quark and the anti-quark as a function of distance. So if you take something like a pion or a proton that's made up of quarks and you try to pull one of them out, as you try to pull it out, you increase the amount of energy you put in. So you're putting in a larger and larger amount of work and that force never decreases. So it would take an infinite amount of energy to pull the quark in its pure state out of the proton or out of a pion. And eventually it becomes more energetically favorable to create a new quark anti-quark pair instead. And so if you try to break the proton apart and ionize a quark out of it to measure its structure, you won't succeed. Instead, you will create an explosion which has a whole shower of new protons, neutrons, pions, and everything else. So I would compare the situation to trying to take a bar magnet and break it in half, that uh, no matter what you do, you will never be able to get an isolated magnetic monopole. Every time you break the bar magnet, you're just going to get a new bound state, if you like, of a magnetic dipole. And so the situation is similar for the nuclear force. And uh, so as a consequence, when you put side by side a measurement of fundamental interactions between the scattering of two electrons, or an electron and a positron, and the scattering of two protons, the difference is extremely pronounced. So uh, this is an event display from a collision at LEP, where you have uh, an electron and a positron colliding into the page, and you have exactly one muon uh, positive charge, one muon negative charge being produced going in opposite directions. So you have a very beautiful two particle in, two particle out event display. That basically never happens in QCD. If you have two protons that are smashing together because of the mess of particles that are created by that strong confining force of QCD, you generate massive showers of particles, uh, huge numbers. So the process of trying to smash protons apart and learn what's inside them is fundamentally very messy. So uh, with that as motivation, I want to talk about two ways that we can use these kinds of measurements to learn something about the internal structure of the proton. Uh, so the first of these is to heat up the proton to extremely high temperatures, so high that the proton then melts and liberates its internal constituents called quarks and gluons. 
Uh, and I think it's a useful observation to point out that as you increase the temperature, you're effectively turning back the time scale to describe the state of the early universe. So as you take conventional matter and heat it up, eventually you get to a temperature around, uh, let's say, 4,000 Kelvin, where you start to ionize all the electrons out of the electrically neutral atoms, and it forms an electrical plasma. And this corresponds to a time scale in the early universe, uh, you know, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, where the universe cooled down and eventually became cool enough that the protons, sorry, the atomic nuclei and the electrons that were floating around in this plasma state were able to find each other and bind into electrically neutral atoms for the first time. Uh, and in the early universe, this transition changed the early universe from being a state of a plasma, which was opaque to light, to, for the first time, becoming transparent when the, uh, the content of the universe was optically transparent. And so this leads to the liberation of that thermal uh, photon bath that was present in the plasma state as it turned into the transparent uh, neutral atoms. And that uh, thermal radiation is visible today as the cosmic microwave background. So the same principle applies to QCD, but at a much higher temperature scale. Uh, if you look back at the early universe now to a temperature of around one microsecond after the Big Bang, much higher temperatures tend to the 12 Kelvin. Then before that transition from an electromagnetic plasma to electrically neutral atoms, at higher temperatures, there existed a plasma of quark and, quarks and gluons that as the universe cooled, condensed for the first time into color neutral protons and neutrons. <clears throat> and so the point is that experimentally by uh, colliding heavy ions at the highest available energies, we can recreate droplets of that plasma state and study the behavior of those liberated quarks and gluons in the plasma phase. So uh, this is performed by collisions of heavy nuclei, uh, typically gold or lead at the highest available energies, uh, several TeV uh, per nucleon at the uh, LHC and several hundred GeV per nucleon at RIC. And uh, there are two defining features of the plasma state that can be created in this way. Uh, the first is that uh, soft particles, particles with low momentum, all interact strongly with each other and they flow together like a liquid. So they flow like a uh, strongly interacting, nearly frictionless, nearly ideal fluid. And that's sort of the cartoon being shown here, that if you have two nuclei that are coming in, they collide and they deposit a massive amount of energy. And then as a function of time and space, that nuclear fireball expands and cools. And you see the flow of those soft momentum particles as they eventually cool and condense into color neutral hadrons, just like in the early universe that are then measured in the detector. Uh, the other sort of defining feature of the quark gluon plasma state is that very high energy probes, so high energy quarks and gluons, which would punch through at very high speeds and penetrate through the plasma are strongly quenched by the strong interactions of those hard probes with uh, the plasma itself. So uh, here's an example where, uh, say, two jets are being produced in the simulation and uh, one jet of particles uh, escapes here and is measured in the detector as this tower of energy in the calorimeters. Again, you see there's a massive background of soft particles that are being produced and depositing energy, but against that background you can see a clear signal of that jet being produced. But even though there's a counterpart jet that it's recoiling against, uh, much of the energy of that jet is lost or diffused by the strong interactions in the plasma. And so both of these features are complementary that you have the strong interactions among the soft sector that leads to a collective flow or an almost hydrodynamic behavior. And simultaneously, you have the strong interactions and quenching of hard probes. Uh, did I hear a question? I don't, no, I don't think so. Okay. So uh, regarding the soft sector, uh, even though the interactions are extremely strong and extremely complex, there lead, uh, this leads to a rather simple effective theory description, and that effective theory is the theory of hydrodynamics. And the simple, perhaps overly simple, way to understand this is that hydrodynamics is an effective theory of a short mean free path. So uh, we can think of fluid flow on many different length scales at the level of a hurricane in the atmosphere, water over a waterfall, aerodynamics uh, in a wind tunnel, 
the common feature of all of these things that mean that they behave hydrodynamically is that the mean free path of the system is much shorter than the length. And in this limit, it doesn't really matter so much what the microscopic details are of the interaction. All you're really sensitive to are the gross long wavelength properties, which are really conservation laws, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and conservation of charge. And then in that case, all of the details of the microscopics are encoded in parameters of the hydrodynamic theory. So they are encoded in things like the viscosity, the electrical conductivity, the thermal conductivity, and the equation of state. And so this is definitely the case for heavy ion collisions, where the very strong interactions among quarks and gluons uh, leads to an extremely short mean free path. And this is really a double-edged sword for the purposes of the experiment. It means that uh, the, the nearly perfect fluid uh, allows you to predict with very high accuracy how the fluid evolves from its initial state through the transport parameters into the final state. But it also means at the same time that you are extremely sensitive to your assumptions about what those initial conditions are. So uh, to a rather high degree of accuracy, hydrodynamics uh, preserves and mirrors the geometry of the initial condition in the momentum distribution of particles that are produced in the final state. So in our uh, group at Urbana-Champaign, one of our graduate students called heavy ion collisions nature's Fourier transform, and I think that's quite accurate. So what's being illustrated here are uh, pressure gradients associated with different geometries of the initial state. So if at the moment of the collision, your uh, overlap region, the overlap geometry of two colliding nuclei is highly elliptical, then uh, there are massive pressure gradients that are different along the short axis of the ellipse versus on the long axis of the ellipse. And so the elliptical geometry of the initial state is directly related to the anisotropy of the forces that are acting on the plasma as it expands. And that leads to a corresponding anisotropy of the uh, momentum distribution of particles in the final state. So what you have essentially is a, a, a Fourier transform or a mirror where the elliptical geometry of the initial state transforms into an elliptical flow of momentum in the final state. A triangular geometry of the initial state maps into a triangular flow of the final state and so on. And this means that uh, your predictions for how a heavy ion collision unfolds are highly sensitive to whatever assumptions you make about the nature of that initial uh, collision geometry. So I want to unpack a little bit what these geometrical features are and how we see them reflected in data in heavy ion collisions. Uh, so one of the, the first most uh, direct handles that we can get on the collision geometry is from the total number of particles that are being produced. And this is a measure called centrality. Uh, so what's being shown here is a plot, I think it's from Elise, of uh, just the multiplicity of particles. So counting number of particles that are produced. Uh, so that's here on the x-axis. And this is a histogram. So you have in arbitrary units the probability of producing each of these number of particles. And the number of particles that is produced is strongly correlated to the collision geometry because the more the overlap area, the more particles that get produced. So there's a strong correlation between how far you are out on this x-axis, say if I bin by percentiles and I select on the most 0 to 5 percent or uh, you know, 5 to 10 percent uh, collisions, then the events that lie out here with the most number of particles being produced are events that have the smallest impact parameter, the most complete overlap between the colliding nuclei. And that most complete overlap is also the roundest. So there's a correlation between the number of particles being produced or the centrality and the shape of the event. So that as you have more centrality, more particles being produced, your event is more round. And as you dial down to lower and lower centrality bins, you select on events that are more elliptical. And so what one sees is a nice correlation between the centrality of the event as measured in these kind of bins and the amount of elliptic flow, that sort of cosine two theta anisotropy that's being produced. So uh, you need some assumption of the initial conditions to describe this, and it's remarkable how far you can get with extremely simple models. The uh, historical starting point for this in the field was uh, to treat the colliding nuclei as if they were smooth balls of density. Uh, this goes by the name of the optical Glauber model. And this is really sort of a mean field picture of the colliding nuclei. You say nucleus number one has a smooth density that's basically a Wood-Saxon density. Nucleus number two has its own smooth density. They collide with some impact parameter and I just calculate the smearing of those smooth densities. 
And that correctly captures the behavior of that elliptical shape as a function of impact parameter. And that gets quite a lot of basic features of heavy ion collisions correct. But one thing that it cannot get correct is the fact that in this smooth overlap picture, there is an exact mirror symmetry plane. So that uh, you will never be able to generate a triangular flow or a triangular anisotropy that comes from this smooth picture, since there's always exactly a mirror symmetry that uh, reflects left to right. And so while this gets a nice description of the elliptical behavior, it gets completely wrong the uh, triangular behavior. And that's because the geometry at a mean field level cannot capture that triangular shape. So uh, a minimum necessary starting point to describe heavy ion collisions has to include fluctuations. In addition to the sort of mean field smooth picture, you have to include the fact that the geometry of the colliding nuclei vary from one event to another. <clears throat> So in addition to just the smooth pictures, instead of saying I have a smooth blob of density, now I say my lead nucleus is composed of exactly 208 nucleons. Maybe each one of my nucleons has on average a smooth probability distribution in a Wood-Saxon density. But uh, if I sample 208 times the location of those nucleons, and then I allow each of those nucleons to collide with each other, then you produce an event geometry that is not perfectly smooth and something that is not perfectly mirror symmetric. And the inclusion of those nucleon level or say fluctuations of nucleons within the nuclear envelope level is a minimum ingredient to have a description of the initial state of heavy ion collisions. And this goes by the name of a Monte Carlo Glauber system. Monte Carlo Glauber model. And the, the key notion here is that although on average the triangularity of this collision is zero, uh, event by event it's not zero. And so you can end up with an event sort of like this that has a typical triangular shape that will produce triangular flow. And that gives you a triangular flow that is smaller than the amount of elliptical flow since that already exists at a mean field level, but it's not zero. And you can calculate the systematics associated with that. And I think this really emphasizes the importance of fluctuations in a heavy ion collision. This is also a consequence of that almost perfect fluid, the very low viscosity, so that you have uh, extreme sensitivity to the event by event fluctuations. And uh, studying the statistical distribution of the elliptic and triangular flow, the statistical cumulants of that distribution event by event, is a powerful discriminator between different models. So uh, this sort of leads us to the canonical picture of how a heavy ion collision unfolds, that you have uh, distributions of individual nucleons inside the nucleus. They generate some collision geometry that deposits energy in roughly a two-dimensional plane. The QCD fireball expands and cools and then sort of reproduces the uh, cooling and freeze out of the early universe eventually uh, passing through the QCD phase transition where you condense the quarks and gluons into bound states of protons, neutrons, and pions. And then eventually at lower temperatures where the density and the energy density are so low that the particles don't rescatter off each other anymore, then you freeze the momentum distribution of the particles. And then those are what are ultimately measured in the detector. So uh, this is an illustration of one such simulation uh, you start with an initial condition that has some uh, elliptical overlap, and as a function of time, you watch the fireball expand and cool, and then translate the elliptical geometry in this shape to an ellipse that is expanding in a perpendicular direction. Uh, the thing that's remarkable to me as someone who doesn't know that much about hydrodynamics is uh, how much of hydrodynamics is completely encapsulated within just a linear response, something that says, uh, elliptic flow in the final state is roughly proportional to the elliptic uh, geometry of the initial state. And you don't need to know anything about the details of this Pearson coefficient which is being reflected here. Uh, suffice to say that this is just a measure that compares the amount of elliptic flow in the final state with the elliptic geometry in the initial state. And uh, when this number is close to one, there is a perfect correlation, a perfect linear response between uh, the momentum flow in the final state and the geometry of the initial state. When it's closer to zero, uh, that's a poor description. And you can see that for a range of collision systems across a range of energies, a linear response picture about the simplest thing that you could possibly do to describe the black box of hydrodynamics works incredibly well. So uh, this standard paradigm of uh, large collision systems and uh, sort of leading degrees of freedom is well established. 
And uh, so it's interesting to look at where that paradigm is expected to break or how one can generalize upon that paradigm. One thing that you can do is you can say that uh, my conservation laws that govern hydrodynamics are more than just conservation of energy and momentum, which describes the vast majority of particle production that comes out. In addition, you have conservation of charge. But if the initial state, the initial information that you put in is just my colliding nuclei deposit a bunch of energy, then your initial condition is something that has energy density, but it has zero charges. Uh, in principle, there are three different kinds of charges that QCD can possess. Uh, you can have baryon number, the number of particles minus antiparticles carried by quarks. Uh, electric charge, of course, which is different between the up and down quarks. And uh, also strangeness, which is a quantum number carried only by the strange quarks. So in principle, the standard uh, initial condition for a heavy ion collision looks something like this, that you have a 2D map of your energy density, but the various charges are all taken to be zero. Uh, and that is true at an average level, because in high energy collisions, most of the valence degrees of freedom, the protons, the neutrons, the quarks inside them are traveling with such tremendous energy that they punch right through each other and they go straight down the beam pipe. So most of the energy that's deposited in heavy ion collisions comes from gluons, just the pure energy uh, associated with the nuclear force. But even though that's true on an average level, we know that there are fluctuations that are absolutely essential to describe heavy ion collisions. And those gluons can fluctuate into quark-anti-quark -quark pairs. So the initial condition that is sort of industry standard for describing a heavy ion collision at high energies is still using a mean field description to describe the charge sector. And one can relax that assumption. You can go beyond it to include in you know, more or less rigorous ways the generation of quark-anti-quark -quark pairs in the initial geometry. So this is a project that I worked on with the, the group at Urbana-Champaign where we took a theory calculation uh, that was based on the color glass condensate effective theory of QCD at high energies. And we calculated using that theory, the probability of a quark or a gluon to fluctuate into a quark anti quark pair. And I spent that summer with the group uh, writing that up into a Monte Carlo simulation that takes the initial 2D energy density and then cycles through and grabs blobs of energy one at a time and pretends that they're gluons and gives each of those gluons a chance to split into a quark-anti-quark -quark pair. So this is a way of taking an initial geometry, which you know maybe your group has already uh, developed and tuned to describe the gross particle production data, the bulk uh, soft particle production, and then generate for it uh, complementary maps that may you know may be representative of what you would see in a heavy ion collision of the charges that would be produced if those gluons can fluctuate into quark-anti-quark -quark pairs. And depending on which flavor of quark and anti-quark you produce, you generate different amounts of baryon number, electric charge, or strangeness. So this is an example of a kind of uh, initial condition map that comes out of that simulation, which we call icing. And uh, you see by eye that there's one interesting difference between the shape of the event in the energy density and the shape of the event in the charges. The baryon number map and the electric charge map closely mirror the geometry of the energy density itself. And that's because uh, the lightest of the quarks, the up and down quarks, which are so light that they're almost massless, carry baryon number and they carry electric charge. And since they're almost massless, there's basically no threshold to produce them. So you can produce quark-anti-quark -quark pairs even far out in the periphery of the event so that you get an event that overall looks like the geometry of the energy density. But the strange quarks are different. The strange quarks have a non-trivial mass threshold. Uh, it's around 100 MeV for the mass of the strange quark. And that means that the strange quarks cannot be pair produced out in the periphery. They can only be pair produced in hot spots that have enough local energy density to be able to generate them. So you not only generate fewer of them, you generate them in a way that is correlated with a different aspect of the geometry, the, the distribution of hot spots, rather than the bulk distribution of the event itself. So uh, the way that I like to sell this is to call it multi-messenger femtoscopy. And you know it's a buzzword, but I think it's also got some truth to it. Because in the same way that adding gravitational waves gives us another lens to study astronomy, looking at charge distributions and the role of those charge fluctuations in the initial state is adding totally different and independent information about the state, uh, about the initial state, that can allow you to study its evolution as a function of time. 
So what I'm talking about here is charge distributions in the initial conditions of high energy heavy ion collisions. Most of the time when people are thinking in this field about charge dynamics in heavy ion collisions, we're thinking about lower energy heavy ion collisions. Uh, and this is uh, part of a major thrust from the RIC program uh, called the beam energy scan to try and lower the temperature and lower the energy of the quark gluon plasma to see it turn off. Uh, we always expected that the quark gluon plasma that is produced at high energy should be a high energy effect. And as you turn down the temperature, you should see that uh, the signals of the quark gluon plasma, the collective flow and the jet quenching turn off at some energy. But what is perplexing is that the attempts to turn off the quark gluon plasma thus far have not been very successful. That those signals seem to persist down to remarkably low energies. And so that's also related to what kind of plasma you're exploring. So if you think that the quark gluon plasma that is being produced at very high energies is maybe still being produced at somewhat lower energies, then you're probing a different region of the thermodynamics when you turn down the energy. So this is a sketch of the QCD phase diagram as a function of temperature and chemical potential. At the very highest collision energies produced at, say, top RIC or top LHC energies, you're basically creating an initial condition for the plasma that is very high temperature and has, on average, zero net protons or neutrons inside it. So this is the net baryon chemical potential. And the fact that this is uh, close to zero corresponds to what I said before, that uh, most of the baryon number, the protons and neutrons that was present in the original colliding nuclei, keep going straight down the beam pipe at very high energies. And you end up with something that has uh, you know, zero net baryon number contained within the plasma. But as you turn down the collision energy, you increase the probability that you're actually going to stop some of that baryon number and deposit some of the net charges the valence charges of the protons and neutrons of the colliding nuclei into the plasma. So you're really moving down in temperature and out in baryon chemical potential. And uh, that's of extreme interest for trying to study the thermodynamics of the QCD phase diagram, because the continuous crossover that is known to exist at low, low net baryon density between the confined gas of hadrons and the deconfined plasma is expected to change at some finite density into a first order phase transition. And so there's a, ma a massive effort to search for that crossover turning into a critical point and learn about the associated critical phenomena of QCD in that region. So if you're interested in the beam energy scan, then considering charge dynamics is really mandatory because now you are depositing net charge into the plasma and even at a mean field level, it can't be ignored. But the point that we were interested in was to say, even along this line, even when the net number is zero, that the fluctuations of charge can allow you to learn something about the charge transport parameters, electrical conductivity, baryon number conductivity, et cetera. Even in the limit of very high energies, where actually we understand the dynamics of the plasma the best. And uh, if you want to study the behavior of the quark gluon plasma in uh, finite densities and learn something about charge transport, then you really have many effects that can potentially be competing with each other. Uh, including the dynamics of charge transport and the dynamics of the critical point. So uh, trying to turn off the behavior of the quark gluon plasma is uh, also something that is pursued by going from a region where hydrodynamics should be best applicable to a region where hydrodynamics should start to fail. And there's a lot of caveats associated with this that I'm happy to discuss offline, but uh, this was what uh, part of what motivated the goal to look for small systems. That if I go from collisions of large nuclei like lead on lead or gold on gold, and I dial down the size of the collision system to say oxygen oxygen or even proton gold, then I should see the assumptions that make hydrodynamics reasonable start to fail. And you should see uh, the signals of the quark gluon plasma turn off. And what's remarkable is that even in the smallest of systems, so certainly in proton gold and uh, some indications even in high multiplicity proton proton, uh, these events, these features do not seem to turn off. And these, uh, these systems that are being created are somehow still describable by hydrodynamics, even in a region where its assumption should be extremely invalid. And so this is a, a subject of active debate within the community about what's going on in these small systems and how to interpret them. I don't want to try and unpack that debate too much, but I wanted to mention, even if you believe that what's being produced in these systems is a roughly thermal uh, hydrodynamic system, 
the assumptions that, that you have to make about the collision geometry should make you extremely uncomfortable. So uh, this is an illustration of the typical collision geometry probed in small systems, uh, here published by the Phoenix Collaboration. The idea behind this was to say that if you compare collisions of proton on gold, deuterium on gold, and helium on gold, when you go from one to two to three colliding nucleons on the small side, that you can dial the geometry of the colliding system between something that's roughly round, that has very little ellipticity and very little triangularity, to something highly elliptical in the deuteron, to something that has now non-trivial triangularity with helium. That's all well and good, but this picture only makes sense if you treat the proton itself as being round and having no internal structure. If you make any other assumption, if you say my proton is made up of of quarks. It is a bound state of at least three valence quarks, and that proton doesn't have to be just a single smooth Gaussian. That picture can change quite substantially. I'm not necessarily endorsing this particular calculation, but the conclusion is certainly a robust one, that you get very different implications for the geometry of the colliding system if you assume that the proton is round versus if you assume that the proton has structure. And so this should make you very uncomfortable about the assumptions you have to make about the structure of the proton. And that leads me to the part of saying, if we need input for the heavy ion program about what the structure of the proton is, how can we measure it? And so the way that we measure the structure of the proton directly in vivo is by upgrading the Rutherford gold, gold foil experiment to even higher energies. Uh, so in exactly the same way that the Rutherford scattering experiment took a high energy beam of particles and looked for high recoil events to measure short distance physics, uh, if you upgrade that to orders of magnitude higher energy, then you get deep and elastic scattering, which is the process of using a simple electromagnetic probe like an electron colliding on a proton with the highest available energy. So here is shown an event display from Hera. And just by measuring the distribution of energy and momentum of that recoiling electron, you can infer from momentum conservation what the distribution of energy and momentum was of the particle that you struck inside the proton. And these high recoil events are ones that are really measuring extremely short distances inside the proton. And so you can see here the picture where the electron is recoiling off and the proton is being shattered, uh, exploded into a billion constituents. So when you do these kinds of deep and elastic scattering measurements to infer the density of quarks and gluons inside the proton, the picture that you get is something like this. The horizontal axis here is called X, and uh, there's a lot of interesting physics associated with X. But for the purposes of this discussion, uh, X can be associated with the fraction of the proton energy that was being carried by the particle that you struck. So when X is close to one, you're hitting the dominant degrees of freedom of the proton that are long-lived permanent properties like the valence quarks. When X is very small, you're hitting the very low energy quantum fluctuations inside the proton instead. And so by performing deep elastic scattering measurements many, many times, you can reconstruct what those statistical distributions are. And so uh, shown here on this logarithmic plot, you see the distribution of valence degrees of freedom, the up and down quarks in the proton versus the quantum fluctuations, the quarks and gluons. So what I want to emphasize here is that the proton has structure and the proton structure is very different depending on what regime you look at it in. In the region of large X, you really are seeing the permanent properties of the proton and the proton looks like a dilute system. So the naive picture of the proton is that it's made up of three valence quarks, two up quarks and one down quark. And that's more or less what these valence distributions are telling us, that there are roughly twice as many up quarks as down quarks. And the peaks here are roughly around X of one third. And that's exactly what you would expect if the proton were exactly three quarks and each one shared an equal one third of the proton energy. But the peaks are not exactly at one third, they're downshifted slightly. And that's because QCD is a dynamical theory that allows the quarks to bleed off some of their energy into radiation. And that radiation is overwhelmingly given by low energy constituents. You have a very large number of low percent energy uh, quantum fluctuations. These are overwhelmingly gluons, which dominate the initial conditions of heavy ion collisions. But as I mentioned before, uh, the probability of those gluons to fluctuate into quark anti-quark pairs is not negligible. These are only down by about a factor of a third. 
So there are two qualitatively different pictures of the proton, depending on what regime you look at, the dilute proton that you see at large X or lower energies, and the dense picture of the proton, which is dominated by quantum fluctuations that you see at low X and the highest energies. And so you have to take into account both of these features when trying to understand where the structure of the proton comes from. This is part of the origin of the long-standing proton spin puzzle. Uh, when it was originally discovered in the 80s, it was referred to as the proton spin crisis. Uh, and this is because the structure of the proton in terms of its spin distribution is absolutely different from what we expected based on our intuition coming from the hydrogen atom. So from ENM and the hydrogen atom, we know that spin pairing gives you uh, the ground state by the hyperfine mechanism that uh, anti-aligns the spin of the proton with the spin of the electron, so that the ground state of hydrogen has total spin zero. If spin pairing is the mechanism at work in quantum mechanics, then it makes perfect sense to say that inside the spin one-half proton, you should expect that two of the quarks should have spin pairing that would cancel their spin out, and the remaining spin one-half quark would give you the spin one-half of the proton. So this was what was expected in these earliest measurements of the spin structure of the proton from polarized deep and elastic scattering. But the picture could not be more wrong. Instead of finding 100% of the proton spin carried by the quarks, in measurements we have found that actually only about 25% of the spin of the proton is carried by the quarks itself. And that really tells us that the structure of the proton is vastly different than the structure of the hydrogen atom. Uh, measurements of the gluon polarization from RIC through polarized proton-proton collisions uh, have told us that the gluon fields themselves are polarized. The amount of that polarization is reported as around 0.2 with large error bars. 0.2 as a fraction of a spin one-half is about 40%. So there's lots of uncertainty on that number, but what is clear is that even including all of the polarization of the quarks, all of the polarization of the gluons, that does not completely account for the total spin of the proton. So even so, there is significant room left for orbital angular momentum uh, of the structure of the ground state of the proton. And again, so this picture could not be more different. And we don't have a good unambiguous experimental way yet of measuring that orbital angular momentum. We have to infer it indirectly from other measurements of the spins of the quarks and the gluons. Uh, so this is only one of the possible puzzles that one has to tackle about what the structure of the proton is. That deep radiation regime presents its own problem. Uh, and that is the fact that this extreme growth of the amount of gluon and even quark anti-quark uh, quantum fluctuations cannot continue at this rate forever. So you can calculate how fast these things are growing. You can predict from theory, excuse me, how fast uh, quarks and gluons should radiate more gluons. And the answer is uh, unsustainable. You get essentially an exponential growth as a function of rapidity, which is a power law growth as a function of x. And if that were to continue forever, you would overfill the proton. You would essentially lead to scattering probabilities that are greater than 100% because you have overfilled the total amount of uh, density inside the proton. So uh, technically this means that this would be at odds with fundamental constraints of unitarity in the quantum field theory. And so this leads to the prediction that this exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely. The exponential growth is characteristic of what happens when you have a dilute system that is free to radiate more stuff all the time without worrying about what happens to it afterwards. But at sufficiently high densities, the probability to radiate more gluons begins to compete with the probability for gluons to rescatter or to recombine. And in that high density regime, you can hit a detailed balance between emission of more gluons and recombination of existing ones that leads to a saturation of the gluon density. And so this prediction of uh, turnover of that growth of quantum fluctuations and a saturation of the gluon density is a fundamental non-negotiable feature of quantum field theory. Uh, if this doesn't exist, we are in deep, deep trouble because something, uh, something fundamental about the theory is broken. But this has never been discovered. We, uh, people have looked very hard to try and see evidence of that uh, decreasing uh, rate of growth. There are various signals, but it's hard to disentangle one that is a clear, unambiguous uh, uh, proof of gluon saturation. So uh, this is the motivation for the uh, construction of the electron-ion collider. 
This is a next generation machine that's going to be built uh, around 2030. We expect it to come online around 2030. Uh, we, the community was ecstatic last December when uh, the US Department of Energy finally committed dollars towards the construction of uh, this facility. It will be built as an upgrade to Brookhaven National Labs uh, relativistic heavy ion collider. And the EIC is designed to answer both of these questions, to provide extreme polarization control, extreme precision, to allow imaging of the proton structure in position space, in momentum space, in spin space, as a, an electron microscope in a very literal sense to image the structure of the proton directly. And also to probe the proton, not just in that large X valence region, but deep enough into the low X radiation region that we can see the first clean hints of gluon saturation. Uh, and these questions themselves are fundamentally interesting, but the thing that excites me the most is where these two questions begin to intersect, where you have to really worry about the contribution of the dense radiation regime of the proton to things like the total spin. So uh, these are some punchline plots from a calculation that I did uh, with my former PhD advisor, Yuri Kovchegov, uh, where we were calculating the distribution of quark and gluon spin in the small x regime. So we went back and we took this picture of a cascade of gluon radiation, which is mostly unpolarized, and we generalized the evolution equations to describe the transmission of spin to small x. And when we solved those small x evolution equations that gave us some ballpark prediction for how much of the uh, spin of the proton could potentially be carried at small x. So these are some plots of the existing, uh, you know, best fit plot for the total contribution of uh, polarized quarks to the proton. And so you see the error bars start to blow up where we run out of data. So if we take that existing curve and we supplement it with the small x evolution equations that we constructed, we find that there can be a significant enhancement to the total quark spin contribution to the proton coming from that deep radiation regime. So again, with some loose ballpark estimates, we find that this could be significant up to a 20% absolute enhancement of that quark spin contribution. And interestingly, uh, for reasons that I'm happy to discuss offline, the effect is much, much smaller for the gluons. This seems to reflect the fact that it means something different to have a polarized gluon field, which is related to um, azimuthal anisotropies of the, the gluon field strength tensor, than it is for a polarized quark, uh, which has something like its uh, axial, uh, the, the axial current, which is conserved. Uh, and then to bring the story full circle back to applications to heavy ion collisions, the electron ion collider and deep elastic scattering provide a way to get to arbitrarily small systems. So if part of the puzzle in heavy ion collisions is that by going to small systems, we have not yet seen the signals that we think indicate the quark gluon plasma turn off, then nature doesn't give us smaller stable hadrons than the proton or maybe the pion, but quantum fluctuations do. So if you go to the electron ion collider, you can look not just at the case where the photon directly knocks a quark out of the proton, but the case where the photon fluctuates into a quark-anti-quark -quark virtual system. And the typical size of that system is related to the kinematics of that interaction. And so by binning on that recoil momentum Q squared, you can select on a quantum system of arbitrary size. So this will give us a way to continue the small systems analysis from heavy ion collisions to look at arbitrarily small systems that can be experimentally binned based on the size of the colliding quantum system. And then we can continue searching for when and if those systems turn off at even smaller scales. Okay, uh, so I'm basically out of time. So I just wanted to summarize the big picture of the field right now and why this is an exciting time to be involved in high energy nuclear physics. Uh, I think we are really at the apex of the heavy ion program today, where the fundamental paradigm has been very well established, that we believe that we really can produce and study the characteristics of the quark gluon plasma in collisions of large heavy nuclei. And uh, we understand that the dominant physical mechanisms are the quenching of high PT jets and the collective hydrodynamic flow of low PT soft particles. And we're really looking for the places where that paradigm breaks, and there are very interesting uh, questions at the frontier of that paradigm. 
And if uh, the heavy ion program is today at its zenith, then looking forward to the future, the electron ion collider and cold QCD is the future of nuclear physics in the next 10 years. So this will be dominated by the EIC, which will be built, like I said, as an upgrade to the RIC facility. And the mission of the electron ion collider is to perform that multidimensional proton tomography uh, to really create three or even five dimensional plots of the distribution of quarks and gluons inside the proton as a function of its different kinematics. And then to study how that picture of the proton changes from the dilute valence region to the dense radiation dominated region and search for indications of clean measurements of gluon saturation. So uh, my message to my own graduate students and to yours is that uh, this is an excellent time to get involved in nuclear physics, that the amount of things that we do not understand about the proton and how it arises from the fundamental nuclear force are enough to feed us for a lifetime. QCD has set a buffet for us, and uh, this is the time to get involved. So uh, thank you very much for this chance. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was, this was a really terrific talk. I will forgive you for saying that hydrodynamics is simple at one point. Well, no, so I think this is really a reflection of, you know, the, the I, I'm telling the simple cartoon story. So you guys have, I'm sure, heard far more about the truth of how far from reality this simple picture is, right? So uh, I've learned quite a lot from George and collaborators that, uh, this long wavelength argument is something which is not really valid in the regimes probed by heavy ion collisions and that we have to really generalize the picture of what hydrodynamics might mean. Especially with 50 particles. Anyway, Especially with 50 particles, exactly. Any questions? Um, either raise your hand or even better, porno chat uh, either raise your hand or put your question in chat, and I'll uh, and I'll unmute you when your turn comes. Um, on chat is easier for me to see who raised their hands first. That's all. Uh, uh, okay, Mileto. Um, I guess I'll read it out from the past. Could we count the number of quark and antiquark pairs produced by electrons in a small region of geometric acceptance? We count the number of quark and anti-quark pairs that are produced in a small region of geometric acceptance. Uh, well, you can't count the quarks and anti-quarks directly, so you have to count the hadrons that come out of it. So there's always still some of that ambiguity between what you measure at the hadron level here and what you want to calculate from first principles there. Um, yeah, you can certainly measure the number of uh, particles of a given species that are produced in a given region uh, uh, given region of your detector. The event by event fluctuations are large, so you generally have to look at the statistical distribution of these things. So what we're thinking of is uh, what statistical cumulants will tell you the most about the relative fluctuations of those uh, hadrons versus anti-hadrons, say pi plus versus pi minus, or pions versus kaons that gives you access to that. Okay. I have a, I actually have a question that is for many years when we found, regarding sat the thing you said about saturation and sort yes. of, you know, you and many people kind of describe it as inevitable. Yes. In the context, when people started, you know, when the EMC puzzle arose, the, the fact mm -hmm. that work wave functions seem to be very different in nuclei versus in nuclear versus in proton proton collisions, what people invented at the time was called shadowing. Yes. Um, it takes a while to understand what it is because in the literature it's kind of used as a magic word. Right. But, but it's basically the propagation of a parton inside the nucleus. And it doesn't have shadow. I mean, it encounters other quarks and it's kind of like a shadow, hence the word shadowing. And it doesn't have to be perturbative. I mean, that's, that's the right. difference. So it doesn't have to be perturbative because while the parton is perturbative and the Q squared is perturbative, the size of the nucleus is infrared and the infrared and the ultraviolet and an extended system really don't have to factorize. Um, and the moral of the story is that there is, at least as far as nuclear are concerned, 
there, there is really two scales. There is an ultraviolet scale, which is partons, and there is an infrared scale, which is the system size. Mm -hmm. Which for high energies and in the BFKL approximation kind of goes into even a proton-proton system because in rapidity, the system becomes extended. So yeah. my sort of, my question is, um, are we really sure that non-perturbative physics fact that we can use perturbation theory for low X even at high energy? And a sort of more technical version of this question is to what extent are shadowing, considering that these are quantum systems, saturation happens before the collision, shadowing happens after the collision, but these are quantum systems and therefore you have sort of some over paths between scattering. Yeah, states. yeah. Are these really different things? And like, how sure are we that a perturbative picture is what we need at low X high energy. I mean, you know, because... So those are two excellent questions, Georgia. Let me see if I can tackle them one at a time. So yeah. you were asking about the role of perturbative versus non-perturbative physics when it comes to understanding the, the small X evolution. And uh, I mean, that is a completely valid question. So the, the people who are really like hardcore proton structure folks who mostly are doing calculations out here in the large X region, are deeply skeptical of some of the assumptions that go into the calculations that, you know, BFKL evolution, all of these things that predict the behavior at small x. So uh, most of the derivations that exist for, uh, you know, small x evolution, BFKL, BK, all of that stuff, these are things that are typically valid to some leading logarithmic approximation or maybe next to leading logarithmic accuracy. That is a very far cry from the degree to which we believe we understand factorization, which is really the ability to quarantine out non-perturbative physics from the perturbative part, which is something that can be proven to all orders in perturbation theory, but uh, order by order in powers of the hard scale, which is a much stronger theoretical constraint than just something order by order in leading logarithms. So I, I think that is a valid question to ask, and it is certainly not as settled here for what that picture should look like as it is settled here. The question about um, perturbative versus non-perturbative unitarization is another really important one. And this is one that I am still learning things about from other experts in the field. That, uh, yeah, so the when, when one is talking about the inevitability of saturation, uh, yeah, one should distinguish between the perturbative picture that comes from quarks and gluons radiating more gluons and how that leads to a rise in density versus the really long distance uh, growth of density from, say, non-perturbative generation of pions. Both of them contribute, but the, the statement that I have about the inevitability of saturation is that even in the perturbative sector by itself, the amount of density that is being generated at short distances by this radiation is already enough to violate saturation. So maybe one way to say this is that um, one unitarity constraint is on the total density of the proton, as reflected in the total growth of these things at small x that is related to but separate from a local unitarity constraint, which is talking about the approach to the black disk at a fixed point and impact parameter. And integrated over impact parameter, you really have these strong contributions from the long distance non-perturbative physics. But even at one point in impact parameter, you see the approach to the black disk that you need gluon saturation for. So I would still maintain that saturation is non-negotiable, but the perturbative picture of unitarization and saturation is probably not enough to describe the overall saturation of the density of the proton, including the non-perturbative growth of the radius of the black disk. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you had a second question. Can you remind me? Let, uh, you know, uh, Andre had a question. Let me let him ask and then maybe I'll ask mine. Yeah, okay. Uh... Still going on what the Giorgio asked and you said, Matt. Yes. Um, yeah, this actually is highly non trivial. I mean, the impact parameter dependence of the yes. matter inside the proton. So you kind of need a mass to regulate that when you solve like the Poisson equation and when That's you're right. doing classical, classical right. angular equations like BNL guys. So That's right. yeah, this is highly non trivial. Yeah, um, absolutely. I agree. Um, 
Yeah, I'm going back to your plot about the V V two and V three, where you compare uh, like Sonic, MSTV, and so on. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, if I remember well, MSTV, uh, someone that made the calculation later found an error yes, and everything yes. screwed up. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, so, and that this is sort of. If I remember well, they bypass like classifying and music evolution because they have a formalism where they don't need to evolve the system to get this uh, anisotropy. So I actually, I think I have two questions. So first, I don't know if you, you should know about this, but uh, when when like Bjorn Shank and company do their uh, IP Glasma thing, mm -hmm. they, in, and isotropy they have there is like the initial initial state momentum and isotropy, or they have like to do the pre transformation of their, their energy density or whatever they put there, and they get like some uh, anisotropy later. I, I never could get that right. So within IP Glasma, they really have uh, initial flow contributions. So they they solve, as you say, the classical Yang-Mills equations to get the initial energy momentum tensor, including the momentum density components, the T0Is. So they really have some amount of coming from classical Yang-Mills initial momentum anisotropy, as well as initial geometry to begin with. Um, our group at Urbana-Champagne has had some interesting discussions with them about what they do or don't do for the Tij, the viscous uh, shear and bulk components of mm -hmm. the energy momentum tensor because they get those as well. But uh, there's some important mismatches that happen when you go from a conformal theory like classical Yang-Mills yeah, to trying sure, to match yeah. onto a non-conformal theory. Sure. So uh, they do have some component that is momentum space yes, from this. That's correct. Okay, good. And uh, regarding the fluctuations, like V3 is, is uh, Odd moment, odd uh, anisotropy coefficient yeah. is induced by fluctuations. So, and uh, well, from the start, you see that CGC or MSTV get this wrong. Basically, if I, I might be wrong, but they, they do consider some Gaussian weight function, right? The MV model yes. in their calculation. Yes, that's so right. They, so, you have some initial condition for the evolution, yeah, like MV. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, everyone does MV simply because uh, it's hard to consider high order uh, corrections to the MV model, although they are already uh, calculated in the literature. Uh, could this be an indication that you need like high order corrections to the MV model, especially for, for uh, small systems like protons? Because uh, a cubic term that we induce like a other own type contribution would contribute to a, a initial state uh, Azimotal anisotropy. So I, I'm going to have to ask you to clarify what kind of higher order corrections you're talking about. So you mentioned the Otteron. The Otteron contribution is one that's not very suppressed, that enters only at a single alpha s uh, correction relative to the leading Pomeron contributions. Yeah. The suppression factor that gives you V3 out of the dilute dense picture is a different kind of suppression. So this is a margin of suppression to the dilute dense picture where you are leading, looking at uh, sort of I would call them next to dilute dense corrections in the dilute side. So the, the reason that you have, it is, it is correct parametrically that you get a smaller V3 coming out of a CGC calculation than you do V2. Uh, in dilute dense, the no, V3 no, yeah, is exactly is zero. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so can you clarify really which corrections are you asking about? Yeah, no, the, you have the MV model, which is quadratic in the core charges, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't have reasons to stop there. You have a cubic correction to this and a quartic correction as well. At least you need to include this. If you are considering the cubic correction, you need to include the quartic one as well. Otherwise, the action is bounded is not bounded uh, from below. It's like yeah, it that sounds right. Mm -hmm. So you need at least the quartic correction. Uh, if we include uh, like uh, other um, like term, which is cubic. And, yes. and the color charge, this will induce a new mechanism to generate odd VM. Yes, that's from right. The, from the start. Yes. So, but then I, I, I get confused again because then you generate more V3, which would be even wrong here 
if I see. Yeah, so I... we we had this discussion with uh, with Raju and Kevin Dussling, uh, I don't know, early on in this CGC Parton model business, where they were thinking about Otteron type mechanisms to try to generate V3. Uh, of course, so the thing about the Otteron is that it generates the odd harmonics by coupling to uh, to charge conjugation symmetry. So if your initial state is composed entirely of gluons, there is no Otteron. Uh, you don't generate any uh, asymmetries coming from that, but you can get it from quarks. Um, the problem in that case was that the, the Otteron tends to integrate to zero. Um, so the Otteron is a very interesting mechanism that can generate various asymmetries. So what the first paper that I wrote in this field was on an Otteron induced mechanism for trying to generate single spin asymmetries. Mm -hmm. where you can link the spin to a charge fluctuation and then you generate the momentum asymmetry from an Otteron mechanism. And there are still uh, proposals in the field about how an Otteron mechanism can lead to single spin asymmetries, although a little bit different than what we originally have in mind. So uh, if the Otteron is what you're worried about, I think my understanding is that the Otteron is not a viable mechanism for generating V3 in heavy ion collisions, but the Otteron can be important in other kind of spin asymmetries. No, yeah, I, I'm, I'm more worried about like proton proton thing or proton nuclear at least. Yeah, so I mean, I, I am deeply, deeply I, skeptical of the application of CGC formalism that assumes all orders resummation of high density effects in proton proton. Um, yeah, anything I know. that treats the proton as highly <laughs> dense is extremely suspect to me unless you are literally talking about ultra high energy cosmic rays. Yeah, yeah, asymptotics. Yeah, 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 I know. Asymptotics is fine, but in realistic proton-proton collisions, I am deeply skeptical. Certainly one should include, you know, many next to dilute dense type corrections mm -hmm. uh, involving mm -hmm. protons to the MD model uh, and everything else. And the uh, fluctuations, the, uh, well, uh, Bjarchenk and uh, Hickman say they compare with Hera data. Uh, their model with Hera data. But yeah. all, flu all fluctuations they have there is like, uh, put by hand because it's a Gaussian impact parameter. Of course, we don't know how to do it better, but... Uh, it's yeah, so uh, if you're talking about the paper that I have in mind, I think that's a really fascinating, uh, very like beautiful and very rare exercise of trying to link together the, the fluctuation measurements that are important for heavy ions with yeah. uh, the proton structure measurements at Hera. So this was a calculation that looked at deep inelastic scattering data, so really down in this region. Yes. and was looking at the difference between uh, diffractive production of JSI and uh, production of JSI where the proton breaks up. Yes. And the difference between them is related to a variance, essentially. It's a, mm -hmm. a measure of the amount of fluctuations of the, the density in the proton. And yeah, the model that they picked was you know something ad hoc. But to me, the important statement was that there is a demand for some amount of fluctuations. And yeah, we don't know what the correct way to incorporate those fluctuations are. Certainly Bjorn and Heike didn't have the solution when they plugged it in, but you can constrain the magnitude of the fluctuations that are necessary. And I think that's one of the areas that there's a real opportunity for growth and dialogue between the hot and cold QCD fields, because fluctuations are something that the heavy ion folks think about all the time. They are absolutely mm -hmm. important for heavy ions. But most of this picture of the proton that we get from the cleanest kind of factorizable measurements are really mean field measurements. And we have to do better. We need more of those kinds of ideas for how to measure fluctuations of the proton and fluctuations of all the PDFs so that we can make those connections back to heavy ions. Okay, good. Uh, I'll let other people talk now. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. <laughs> my, my short question was um, whether uh, shadowing and saturation are sort of uh -huh. the same thing or physically, I mean, not just, you know, experimentally distinguishable, but you know, uh, can you in a quantum world where you're measuring some of our paths, at least asymptotically, can you distinguish radiation before which saturates from radiation after that after interacts? You see what I mean? Yeah, 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 no, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think you put your finger on the fact that there is no factorization theorem for heavy ion collisions. Yeah. So my answer is uh, in general, no. One can maybe distinguish um, the types of effects that are, you know, that enter at leading twist or leading power in some hard scale versus things that are not. But in general, in heavy ion collisions, there is no separation between uh, what is initial state radiation and what is final state radiation. There is no clean factorization of 
what are the properties associated with this nucleus and what are the properties associated with that nucleus. Um, in fact, it is known that when you have hadrons in the initial state and momentum distributions of hadrons in the final state, that the quantum radiation between them is entangled. It is inseparably entangled. So that's exactly the kind of thing where my you know, cold QCD colleagues who are working on factorization and dilute proton stuff would say, you have no business assuming that you have any ability to separate out initial state radiation from final state radiation in heavy ion collisions. Um, the color flow is completely entangled. So what are you even talking about? So things like V24 is a, like a maximally non-factorizing observable that uh, you, we really don't have a, a handle theoretically for saying that we can cleanly separate uh, where the, the features of the collision are coming from. Even in proton, proton, well, you know, the transverse size is, it's a scale. I mean, it's what the yeah, uh -huh. like, hard scale. Even in proton, proton is asymptotically high S. I mean, this is just simple geometry. The Z becomes infinitely long. The, if you take sort of Bjork and scaling, the yeah. longitudinal coordinate becomes infinitely long. And this is... And this is another infrared length. I mean, BFKL kind of says, well, this is the resummation that converges. Um, but are these things settled there, even in proton proton or not? Um, no, so it, so it depends on what observable saying. you're talking about. Let me, um, let me maybe sketch a diagram for you. Yeah, uh, sure. So um, there's a very famous counterexample when people were thinking about generalizations of factorization. So if I have proton, proton, and you're looking at, say, double pion production, you can have contributions that look like this. I don't know, something like that, where you're looking at two hadrons that are produced in the final state, and you're looking at two particle correlations. So say you want to look at V2 coming from proton-proton collisions. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the kind of picture that you would want to write down, and you would like to be able to show that there's some factorization where I can talk about PDF of proton-1, PDF of proton-2, hadronization, or, you know, fragmentation function, fragmentation function. This is explicitly and famously violated because higher-order corrections that are non-perturbative and cannot be removed yes. entangle both of the PDFs in a completely inseparable way. So yes. there is no version at all of factorization that can exist for this observable. You can't even cleanly separate out what is the property of that proton from the property of that proton, because in this process, the color flow is completely entangled between them. They behave as a single composite object. Okay. So okay. The, the main conclusion is that it doesn't matter if it's dilute or if it's dense. If there are hadrons in the initial state, hadrons in the final state, and you ask anything other than single inclusive at high PT, if you ask any more differential question than that, it is inevitable that you have factorization breaking color connections. That mean you will never be able to cleanly separate out this particle from that particle. You will never be able to separate initial state from final state. Everything is entangled in a way that is never discussed in heavy ions. No, oh, this is this is good to this is good to know. <laughs> hey, yeah. I would really love to know what are the potential implications of this, right? So I don't know necessarily how to mock up a model for how to include crosstalk between you know initial state and final state, but I can certainly imagine models that would introduce crosstalk between nucleus one and nucleus two. So what if instead of my uh, Monte Carlo Glauber where I have nucleus one fluctuating independently, nucleus two fluctuating independently, what if I correlate them? And I say, there is no factorization. These guys can fluctuate together. That should surely have consequences for the final state. Yeah, at, at the same time, you can do uh, like KT factorization based calculations and yeah. get the centrality of heavy ion collisions correct which is basically telling you that you get the correct impact parameter, that, not impact parameter, but the correct correct evolution for the, your saturation scale. Right. right. I should also emphasize that KT factorization is a much weaker kind of factorization than no, any of the other sure, kinds sure. of factorization that I'm talking about here. That yeah, no, no, no. The ones no, that no, are no, valid. No. Yeah, I mean, so these are things like Thomas Lappi would say that they are well known to those who know them well. But yeah. for those who don't know them well, I just want to emphasize that the kind of factorization that is discussed for the EIC 
is a leading power factorization. And the kind of factorization that we think we can apply down here is something that can be violated at next to leading order, next to next to leading order. Uh, it's, it's something that can work at a given order, but it's far from clear how well the picture generalizes. No, sure, sure. Yeah, even the, the convolution of fragmentation functions with the CGC part is not, uh, it's something that works at that order, as you said. Exactly. So take the hybrid parameters, for, for example. So you have like collinear part, CGC part, and fragmentation, but you never take this down to 0.5 uh, GV momentum. You always yeah, exactly. get this from one GV and above because your fragmentation function is perturbative. You don't get like non-perturbative lens, lens type fragmentations. This, this needs to come from a Monte Carlo simulation. Yes, very good. More questions? Take one, take two. If not, I'll stop recording. Thank you very, very much. Um,